on World News Tonight. Floods in Australia. Thousands forced to leave their homes as Sydney drowns in devastating floods. Gaining control. Russia gains ground in the eastern city of Ukraine with President Zelensky not ready to give up. WHO warning. The spread of monkeypox triples in Europe as urgent action is requested to stem the spread. And illuminating skies. Green lights dance across the sky in striking aurora displays in Minnesota. This is Other Than a World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. And we are starting off tonight's coverage from Australia as floods inundated properties as more heavy rain was set to drench Sydney with fresh evacuation orders issued for tens of thousands of residents. To get more details on the devastating floods, let's cross over to other than a World News Special Correspondent, Timothy Philip, who joins us now from Melbourne in Australia. For more, Timothy, over to you. Yes, Shana. Heavy flooding in the Australian state of New South Wales has forced many in Sydney to evacuate. The evacuation order was given on Sunday after Australia's largest city experienced heavy downpours and gale force winds. Relentless rain flooded several suburbs in Australia's largest city, with officials warning of more wild weather to come. With about 30,000 residents in New South Wales, state facing evacuation, frustration swelled in several suburbs in Sydney's west after floods submerged homes, farms, and bridges there, some for the third time this year. This comes as three major rivers burst their banks. The Australian Defence Force has also been dispatched to help locals get to safety. Meanwhile, Australia's weather services predict rain will intensify over the next two days. No loss of lives has been reported so far, as officials urge people to leave their homes when ordered and avoid driving on flooded roads. Back to you, Shinami. All right, thank you. That was Other Than a World News Special Correspondent Timothy Philip reporting from Melbourne in Australia. Russian forces claim they have captured Lisi Chang's in eastern Ukraine, while the Ukrainian president says the fight for the pivotal city will continue. The news comes as Australia pledges to provide more military support for the war torn country. The Russian military claims it has taken full control of the Luhansk region in eastern Ukraine. Russia's defense ministry said Sunday that the region has been, quote, liberated. This comes as Russian forces say they have captured villages around Lichichansk and encircled the city, which had been the final Ukrainian holdout. Ukraine's military later confirmed that its forces had withdrawn from the city. Addressing the nation, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky acknowledged the withdrawal but it pledged that the city will be retaken with more modern weapons. In related news, Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese said Sunday during his visit to Ukraine that his country will provide additional military support to Ukraine. This includes 34 armored vehicles, a number of drones, and some 68 million U.S. dollars. Australia stands ready to continue to support the government and the people of Ukraine for as long as it takes for Ukraine to emerge victorious in defence of your national sovereignty and your homeland. Because you are fighting for the international rule of law. He also added that Canberra will be slapping sanctions and travel bans on 16 more Russian ministers and oligarchs, bringing the total number of Russians sanctioned by Australia to more than 840. He also pledged his country would ban Russian gold imports while giving duty-free access to Ukrainian goods. During his visit, the Australian Prime Minister visited war-torn towns of Bucha and Irpin. The World Health Organization called for urgent action to prevent the spread of monkeypox in Europe, noting that cases had tripled in the region over the past two weeks. The World Health Organization is calling for urgent action in the fight against monkeypox. With over 4,000 confirmed cases, Europe is the epicenter of the outbreak, accounting for 90% of global cases. That figure has tripled in less than two weeks, prompting the World Health Organization to urge action before the virus can gain a foothold. 
Today, I am intensifying my call for governments and civil society to scale up efforts to prevent monkeypox from establishing itself across a growing geographical area. Urgent and coordinated action is imperative if we are to turn a corner in the race to reverse the ongoing spread of this disease. Monkeypox is related to smallpox, a virus that killed millions before it was eradicated in 1980, although monkeypox's symptoms are far less severe. The disease starts with a fever and quickly develops into a rash with the formation of scabs, usually lasting around two to three weeks. Normally confined to parts of Africa, the virus has slowly been spreading across the globe and has now been detected in over 50 countries. Yet the WHO has not yet declared it a public health emergency of international concern. Not declaring a thick down not mean it's not an emergency. It's already a great multi-country, multi-region emergency. And uh, we'll continue assessing the risk based on new information. Countries are slowly beginning to react. The U.S. has ordered 2.5 million doses of a smallpox vaccine licensed to tackle monkeypox and has started targeted vaccinations. The European Medicines Agency is also reviewing another smallpox vaccine as it hopes to expand its arsenal against the virus. West African leaders met in Ghana's capital, Accra, to review sanctions they have imposed on three military-ruled countries in their volatile region. The West African leaders lifted sanctions on Mali's military regime, accepting a March 2024 return to civilian rule and agreed to allow Burkina Faso two years its transition back to democracy. Facing the three military junta's in power in Mali, Guinea and Burkina Faso, the leaders of ECOWAS are expected to take a stand. Mali are the only ones of the three to have been under a full-blown economic embargo for six months. But recent developments have opened the way for an easing of sanctions. Last Wednesday, Bamako revealed the electoral calendar as required by ECOWAS. For the legislative elections, the first round will be on Sunday, the 29th of October, 2023. For the election of the President of the Republic, the first round will be Sunday the 4th of February 2024. Two weeks earlier, a new electoral law had been adopted and a commission in charge of drafting a new constitution set up. A constitutional referendum is scheduled for March 2023. Deadlines described as enormous progress by the entourage of Goodluck Jonathan, the former Nigerian president who is mediating between the Malian junta and ECOWAS. Guinea and Burkina Faso have so far only been suspended from the bloc, but the two countries are exposed, unlike Mali, to a tightening of sanctions. In both cases, the announcement of a 36-month transition period does not sit well with ECOWAS leaders. On the Guinean side, they are trying to show pledges of goodwill to avoid the fate of their Malian neighbours. Last Monday, receiving opposition forces, Guinea's PM praised the efforts of dialogue put in place by his government. We have already set up an interministerial council, a group of colleagues. We are going to refine the group as we go along. The Guinean opposition is calling for the arrival of a mediator from ECOWAS, a mediator that has already been appointed in Burkina Faso, former Nigerian president Mohamedou Isufu. On Saturday, he was in Ouagadougou, where he welcomed the openness to dialogue of the Burkinabe military. But the electoral roadmap proposed by the junta, with a constitutional referendum in December 2024 and elections in February 2025, remains far too distant in the eyes of ECOWAS. Now we turn to Washington as the January 6th committee and top Republican Liz Cheney say that more witnesses are coming forward and that the panel may end up referring criminal charges against former U.S. President Donald Trump to the Department of Justice. Tonight, the January 6th committee promising much more to come, disclosing that new witnesses are providing information. Every day we get new people that come forward. With more hearings expected this month, Vice Chair Liz Cheney saying the committee may ultimately send the Justice Department a criminal referral for former President Trump. There could be more than one criminal referral. Cheney also raising eyebrows when asked whether she might run for president in 2024. 
She's not ruling it out. I'll make a decision about 24 down the road. But another Republican might not wait that long. The New York Times reporting Trump could soon jump into the race, potentially even before the midterms. President Biden saying those midterm elections will determine the path forward on abortion rights. But frustrated Democrats are demanding the Biden administration fight back harder after the Supreme Court ruling. Don't be overwhelmed to the point that we are disheartened and we think that we can't do anything about it. And as Americans hit the road this July 4th holiday, the president also under pressure over soaring gas prices and inflation. Amazon mogul Jeff Bezos slamming the president on Twitter for blaming gas prices on big oil companies, saying it's either straight ahead misdirection or a deep misunderstanding of what's happening. Tonight, the White House hitting back, portraying Bezos as part of the problem. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more World News. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now, dangerous, untreated medical waste in a landfill near Yemen's capital, Sana'a, poses a threat to the environment and health of the locals since Saudi-led airstrike destroyed a waste processing incinerator at the site in 2015. At a landfill near the Yemeni capital, Sana'a, a truck unloads bags of trash onto a seemingly endless sea of garbage. Close by, people stand readied with bags to collect any recyclables they can find amid the piles of waste. The Al Azraqain landfill receives hundreds of tons of trash a day, including dangerous, untreated medical waste generated by hospitals in Sana'a. More than seven years of conflict in Yemen have devastated the economy, displaced millions, and wreaked havoc on the environment. Waste management officials in Sana'a say Saudi-led airstrikes destroyed a medical waste processing incinerator at the landfill site in 2015. Houthi administrators say they are looking for support from NGOs to rebuild the facility. In 2021, the United Nations Development Programme inaugurated a waste-to-energy system in Yemen in a bid to revolutionise the governorate's approach to addressing waste management. The plant, built southwest of the capital, is expected to transform up to five tonnes of solid waste a day. But that's only a fraction of the 1,870 tonnes of waste dumped at Al-Azraqain. Yemen's warring sides, in a major breakthrough, agreed this month on a two-month truce that began on April 2nd, the first since 2016. The deal eased a coalition blockade on areas held by the Houthis, who ousted former president Abd Rabu Mansour Hadi's government from the capital in late 2014. South Korea is seeing a growing number of COVID-19 infections as the country posts its highest tally for a Monday in six weeks. There has been a return to five-digit figures in recent days, with the daily tally over the weekend surpassing 10,000. South Korea is witnessing yet another upward trend in COVID-19 infections. On Monday, the country reported over 6,200 new cases. It's a jump of more than 2,800 compared to the same day last week and is the highest Monday figure in six weeks. Over the weekend, the country's daily tally surpassed 10,000 for two days in a row. Usually, the figure for this period drops as fewer people get tested over the weekend. But these figures signal a change in the trend. And with cases increasing, concerns are mounting over the possibility of another surge. The number of infections will increase continuously until winter. Given that the BA4 or BA5 strain becomes dominant, we predict at least 150,000 to 200,000 cases will be reported daily. It's possible to see another large-scale infection, like we did when the Delta variant was dominant. The authorities say there are numerous reasons behind the latest surge. We believe increased indoor activities and people traveling during summer, waning effectiveness of vaccinations and new strains of COVID-19 are the main causes. The number of imported cases is also on the rise. Pundits say this is mainly because more people are traveling across borders with eased travel restrictions. In preparation for a potential surge this coming fall, Health authorities are gearing up to closely monitor the country's medical system and ensure there are enough hospital beds for those who need them. Now, Americans spent nearly 50 billion U.S. dollars on vitamins and supplements in 2021. 
but do they help or harm? Now that's a question. A new analysis by the Journal of American Association found a little or no evidence that vitamins help prevent heart disease or cancer for an average healthy American. For many of us, getting and staying healthy is usually top of mind. A typical go-to, vitamins. After all, Americans spent nearly $50 billion alone on supplements last year. But a new analysis published in the Journal of American Medical Association says for the average healthy adult, they may not be necessary. They reviewed 84 studies to assess the impact of vitamins and supplements in preventing heart disease and cancer. Dr. Michael Berry is vice chair of the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force. We don't have enough evidence to recommend for or against them with those two exceptions of vitamin E and beta carotene, which we uh, recommend people not take. According to the published analysis, beta carotene was associated with an increased risk of lung cancer and death from heart disease, while vitamin E had no proven effects. Dr. Jeffrey Linder wrote an op-ed about the study. There was a big benefit from multivitamins and supplements we'd sort of know by now. But the vitamin industry, which spent nearly a billion dollars on marketing in 2021, refutes those statements. Always talk to your physician, but they're there to supplement the diet. They're not there to be the principal element of the diet. Doctors do say children and those with chronic illnesses can stand to benefit from vitamins, as well as those who are pregnant. But ultimately, the key to a healthy long life good old-fashioned diet and exercise. Tesla's quarterly deliveries have slowed for the first time in almost two years due to the supply chain constraints. China extended COVID-19 lockdowns and challenges around opening factories in Berlin and Austin took to their toll on the company. Tesla delivered 17.9 fewer electric vehicles in the second quarter from the previous quarter, as China's COVID-19 related shutdown disrupted its production and supply chain. The world's biggest electric car maker said on Saturday that it delivered over 254,000 vehicles in the April to June period, compared to over 310,000 vehicles in the preceding quarter, ending a nearly two year long run of record quarterly deliveries. A resurgence in COVID-19 cases in China had forced Tesla to temporarily suspend production at its Shanghai factory, and also affected suppliers' facilities in the country. Tesla is ramping up production at the Shanghai factory with the easing of the COVID-19 lockdown, which will help boost deliveries in the second half. China has been instrumental in Tesla's rapid increase of vehicle production, with the low-cost, lucrative Shanghai factory producing roughly half of the company's total cars delivered last year. CEO Elon Musk has said demand for Tesla vehicles remains strong, but supply chain challenges still remain. Early in June, Musk told executives that he had a, quote, super bad feeling about the economy and needed to cut about 10 percent of staff at Tesla. Tesla shares have fallen 35 percent so far this year, hit by Musk's $44 billion proposed acquisition of Twitter, the China lockdown and macroeconomic uncertainties. Welcome back to World News Tonight and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. At least six hikers were killed and eight injured after a section of ice collapsed off a mountain in the northeastern Italian Alps and tumbled down a popular hiking route. Thousands of people packed central Tbilisi in a strong show of support for a path for Georgia towards accession to the European Union and NATO. People working in South Korea can receive sickness allowance if they fall ill. The health ministry said the new measure allows employees to rest and recover even when they are sick or injured outside of the workplace. The Israeli military said it shut down three unmanned aircraft launched by the Lebanese militant group Hezbollah heading towards an area where an Israeli gas platform was recently installed in the Mediterranean Sea. Three people were killed and several more were wounded in shooting at a shopping center in the capital of Denmark, adding they had arrested a 22-year-old Danish man and charged him with manslaughter. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. In case you missed to watch any of the stories we air tonight, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. As we leave you tonight, we are leaving you with green lights dancing across the sky in striking aurora displays in Minnesota. Stay safe and have a good night.